Uh, we're doing the book of Job, uh, faithful living in times of crisis. Faithful living in times of crisis. This is lesson number one in this uh, series. And we're going to do a, a brief critical introduction. Not a very long lesson tonight. I want to put all the critical and introductory material together in the first lesson so we can move ahead in lesson number two and uh, get into the characters and all that business. So the title of this uh, series describes uh, the resource as well as the reality and the purpose of this uh, series of studies. Uh, the book of Job will be the main resource that I'm going to use to demonstrate and build the model life hopefully the model Christian life, model Christian attitude that we as Christians should have all the time, but especially during times of crisis. And, and I mean, how do you define times of crisis? You know, if you have economic upheaval, you have health issues, you have social unrest, add to that uh, you know, an important election that's coming along, certainly in this country, uh, there's plenty uh, going on, we could say easily, without, without it becoming uh, you know, over the top, uh, we can easily say that we're living through a time of crisis uh, here. Uh, times of crisis uh, well describes, uh, as I say, the state of not only our lives, but the lives of everyone around us. You know, we all go through challenging episodes in our personal lives going to college for the first time, or getting married, having children, uh, moving. <laughs> All those things are challenging, uh, various episodes in our lives. But it is a rare occurrence when the entire world is challenged by the same event all at the same time. That doesn't happen. That does not happen very often. We read about that in history books, you know, uh, a world war. Okay, World War II, World War I, you know, consumed all the countries in Europe and North America. You know, it affected almost everyone in the world. No one was kind of uh, uh, absolved. No one kind of got away from being affected by the war. That was a worldwide you know, phenomenon, if you wish. And since then, there have been smaller wars and skirmishes and things that happened. But this pandemic that is taking place now is a worldwide phenomenon. They're dealing with it in the Philippines, they're dealing with it in the United States and in Canada and Hawaii, everywhere you go, they're having to deal with this pandemic and it's affecting them, uh, them in many of the same ways that it's uh, affecting us. So if nothing else, this pandemic has the ability to test everyone, regardless of age or social status or worldview, with the very same challenge and reveal the value and the viability of our various belief systems and worldviews. How are the Hindus handling this? How are the Muslim nations handling? Because they're having to deal with the same thing we're dealing with. How do Christians handle a crisis like this? A good time to examine that. And then in the title, I also mention faithful living. And faithful living describes not only the goal or the model life that Christians strive for in both good and bad times, it is the rock and the shelter that will sustain us in this crisis. Marty's prayer, well said, he's mentioned that before and I have as well. And I've heard it from many of you. How do people who have no faith make it? My answer is, well, they just don't. <laughs> they don't make it, or they don't make it very well. So not only is faithful living our response to this and every crisis, it becomes a light and a witness to an unbelieving world thrust further into darkness by this pandemic and this confusion and fear. Make no mistake, People watch how other people are reacting to this thing. How are you reacting? And it doesn't matter if you're a student or if you're a grandpa or if you're a, a, a homemaker or a, a teacher, you know, uh, people around are watching your attitude. How are you responding to the things that are taking place, affecting everyone else 
around them. If there was ever a time for a witness, this is a very good time, a great opportunity for Christian witness. And so Job therefore is the biblical character whose experience most resembles the nature of our experience today. Other characters have suffered, you know, Joseph in the Old Testament, you know, other characters have had challenges, but Job, oh my, he really, you know, he really is going through a lot of what uh, we're experiencing uh, today. Uh, he experienced a one man pandemic and he came through it, battered, bruised, and suffering great loss, irreplaceable loss. You lose a child, you never replace it. I mean, you may have two, three, five, ten more children, but that child you lost is irreplaceable. His experience and reaction is, it's messy at times, and it's not necessarily heroic at times. However, his story provides us with the picture of a man, a faithful and sincere man, however, an imperfect man, and how he reacted to his moment when he was in the eye of the storm. And so the book of Job is valuable, especially during these times of crisis, because it shows us not only what we as believers should do, but it also demonstrates what we shouldn't do. Just like all of us normal people, believers, Job's life is a mixed bag of good and not so good, and even things left unanswered and unresolved. You know, the, the most difficult idea that has been thrust upon us in our uh, culture is the idea of closure. You know, we got to get closure on every single thing, every single debate, every argument, every, every issue has got to get some sort of closure. <laughs> well, <laughs> life doesn't work that way. You can't always get closure. Closure doesn't always happen, no matter how hard you try. And if there's one person who finds out that sometimes you just can't get closure, it's Job. And we're going to see that. We, we can therefore, despite the fact that we can't always get closure, we can therefore relate to him, not only as a Bible character from long ago, but also as a human being doing his best under trying circumstances. So as we do, when we study a Bible book, we're going to begin with some preliminary information about the book and its author and the time it was written and the general theme and maybe look at some outlines before we dive into the, into the subject itself. So let's talk about the literary importance of the uh, book of Job. Aside from its unique subject matter, one feature of this book is the beauty of its writing. Uh, Martin Luther said of it, that it was a magnificent and sublime as no other book in scripture. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King now. Um, Alfred Lord Tennyson, who was a British poet laureate, knew something about poetry. He said of the book of Job that it was the greatest poem of ancient or modern times. So secular individuals recognized the beauty of the poetry found in the book of Job. You know, we often focus so much on the story of Job that we fail to appreciate the quality of the style and the expression of the author. Some scholars have referred to the author of Job as the Shakespeare of the Old Testament, such as the quality and the high mindedness and the beauty of the, uh, of the words that are uh, put together. Of course, we know that God is the author, ultimately, of all the books of the Bible, but he uses people as his instruments of writing. And in using the individual who wrote the book of Job, he, wrote, he used someone who had a great command of the language and uh, patterns of thought. Uh, there's been no consensus uh, among scholars as to the actual author, who wrote it? or the time exactly that this book was written. Since there are no clues within the book itself, there's no kind of internal evidence 
as to its author or date or authorship. You know, when Paul writes an epistle, he says, I, Paul, well, okay, you know, I am writing to you, me, Paul, I'm writing to you, Timothy. Well, you know, there's internal evidence that Paul is the one who wrote that letter. You know. But in Job, uh, the author doesn't name himself. We, we, we're not sure of who it is. Um, as a book, it is uh, grouped according to its style and category. In other words, it's part of wisdom literature, poetry, wisdom literature, which consists of the books in the Bible, uh, the book of Job, the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Uh, so all of that is classified as poetry and wisdom literature uh, in the Bible. Uh, these books are so-called because they deal with human struggle and real life experience. You know, even though the book of Psalms is a book of poetry, uh, the poetry is about real life experiences, uh, especially of King David. He doesn't just write about the beauty of the, the morning sun and how nice the birds are to, to listen and uh, you know, somebody he loves. He, he, he doesn't talk about that. He talks about his relationship with God. He talks about how much he hates his enemies, uh, how much he wants God to punish them, or, or he talks about uh, how much he's messed up and the sins that he's done, and uh, God, please take me back. You know, a real human being talking about his life, talking about his victories and his failures, all of it written. In, in poetic uh, form. And so Job is this kind of, is this kind of uh, uh, book. Uh, there are several ideas about its date and its authorship. Uh, some think it's an early, uh, early Jewish tradition ascribed its writing to Moses. So the Jews early on uh, ascribed Moses as the author, 1400 BC. Later scholars believed it was produced by Solomon. Martin Luther comes back again. He was one of those scholars, uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, he thought uh, Solomon was the uh, one who wrote it. Solomon around 1000 BC. And uh, more modern scholars believe it was written by an unknown author during the time of the exile in the Jewish, of the Jewish people in Babylon, somewhere around 600 years before Christ. Suffice to say, that the book of Job was accepted and included in the canon of the Old Testament uh, by 150 BC. In other words, uh, uh, the Jews uh, accepted that this book was inspired of God. By 150 uh, BC, uh, it was accepted as a part of the inspired writings along with the prophets and, and the Pentateuch and so on and so forth. It was included there and remained there, of course, to this day. One question that comes, uh, the book of Job, is it, is it historical? Was there this guy named Job? You know, is it historical or is it simply a story? It's a poem, you know, which, which is it? That's one other question that some scholars who specialize in the study of Old Testament uh, documents uh, have. Uh, one question, as I say, that arises is if Job is a purely historical book about what happened to a man and his family, or is it a work of fiction that teaches important theological principles? Which is it of the two? Again, the earliest Jewish teachings claimed that Job was history. It was history, a real person experiencing real things. Uh, I go back to Martin Luther. He wrote that Job was a work of poetic imagination set in a historical framework. Well, we know, we know what that is, don't we? We see movies like that all the time. We see movies about the Civil War. You know? uh, it's only a movie and it's based in the Civil War, a true historical event, but it's just a movie. Well, some, some people think, well, this is a, it's a story based somewhat on a historical uh, event, uh, like historical dramas that we, that we see that are based on true events. Some claim that it's an uninspired work by heathen fiction. 
You know, in other words, some people reject it altogether, that it's, it's, it's not inspired, it's not true, it's not anything. Spinoza, for example, Dutch philosopher, that was his, uh, that was his idea. Most conservative scholars, however, hold that Job is an inspired literary work based on a true uh, historical character and events. And that's pretty much what we go with. We don't have any other information that would suggest that it is not about a historical character. And so we, as I say, most conservative scholars, and we are conservative uh, Christians, uh, our point of view about uh, the Bible. And so we believe that there was a Job and Job did live through these things. And this is an inspired uh, record of, of, his, uh, of his life. Um, a more important focus for study, aside from the time and the authorship, is the reason for the book. Why write this book at all? Why include this book? You know, we get it. We get why uh, Psalms are in the Bible. You know, David wrote the Psalms, and so you kind of figure out what's going on during David's life. We know why that's in there. Even Song of Solomon, you know, we know why that's there. Job, you know, why? It's such a depressing, sad thing. Why is that in the, why is that in the Bible? Actually, this book has a, a number of ideas and issues that it deals with that's uh, very important for us to know. Um, one of the earliest views was that it was a study of the patience demonstrated by a good man while he was being tested by various trials. You know, uh, you're wondering who says that? That sounds familiar. Who else says something like that? Well, James says that, doesn't he? In James chapter one, verses two to four, think of Job and think of James writing, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, well, that's what Job did, he encountered various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And we know Job, I, know, I think we're all pretty much familiar with the story, we know that his faith was being tested, we know that almost from the get-go. He doesn't know that, <laughs> but we know his faith is, is being tested. And James is saying, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And we'll find out how Job arrived there uh, later on in our, in our study. So James summarizes the principle that is played out in a man's life in the book of Job. The theme, if someone says, what's the theme of Job? Well, you could say, well, the theme of Job is James one uh, verses two to four, okay? Another uh, important person, uh, a purpose rather, of this book is that the experience of Job points out the falseness of the prevalent dogma at that time, which taught that personal suffering was always the result of personal sin, okay? Now Job himself does not refute this fallacy used by his friends to explain what has happened to him and why. He actually defends himself, but he doesn't completely refute their arguments. Understand what I'm saying? In other words, this book one of the purposes for it was to demonstrate that an idea that was prevalent at the time was, was false idea. And that idea was that if you're good, God will bless you right away. And if you're bad, God will punish you right away. In other words, God's judgment is in real time. And this idea was held you know, by many people at the time. It was the conventional thinking Imagine if this idea was actually the way things operate. <laughs> wow, every day, you know, you, if you did something good, you'd be expecting, come on, let's go, bring it, bring it on, you know? And if, and if you messed up, you know, you, you'd be hiding in your closet, you know, waiting for the, for the roof to cave in. And I want you to keep in mind throughout Job that Job also bought into this idea and that was one of his problems. But we'll, we'll kind of peel that onion when we get there. Now, 
you have to realize the readers who see what goes on behind the scenes, who see things from God's viewpoint, they're able to conclude that this notion, you know, personal sin is the direct cause of personal suffering. We, when we're reading Job, we know that that's not true because we're, we're seeing the story from behind the scenes. Oh, we see the devil, you know, talking to God and, and challenging God to, you know, let him punish Job just to show him that his faith is not as good as it really, you know, we see all of that, but Job doesn't see all of that. And so his belief system is put to the test. Not his belief in God, his belief system as to how God operates is put to the test. And then the most comprehensive idea is that the book of Job deals specifically with the very real problem of innocent suffering. This idea has been the view of the majority of Bible scholars who have written books and commentaries on the book of Job. Here are some summary statements from some of these writers. The important truth revealed in Job is that there is a suffering of the righteous, which is not a decree of wrath, but a dispensation of God's love. This is the heart of the book of Job. One writer, uh, Franz de Leach, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Someone else wrote, you know, what is Job about? Edgar Goodspeed, he says, in the end, Job's problem is left unsolved, except that in the infinite wisdom of God, undeserved suffering must have an explanation beyond our comprehension. This is, after all, the simple doctrine of faith, which does not insist upon explaining everything. I mentioned that at the beginning, remember? Uh, we live at a time uh, and in a culture where Closure, everything's about closure. We got to get closure, you know, let's go, to, let's go for counseling so we can get closure about my mom's death or my dad's early death, or I get closure about why I lost my leg in the war. You know what I'm saying? It's all about closure. And this book here is telling us faith does not need closure to continue on. Very important idea. As he says, this guy Goodspeed, this is after all the simple doctrine of faith, which does not insist upon explaining everything. I mean, if you have to understand exactly how God created the world in order to believe in God, you're not going to believe in God because God himself tells us that by faith we understand that the things that are were created from things not seen. In other words, God himself is telling us, I'm not going to explain to you how I did this. <laughs> You're going to have to take this. This one is going to be by faith. So I love, you know, I, 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 I love uh, archeological, um, what do they call it? Archeological uh, proofs, you know, about uh, the flood and, you know, just data and information that confirm a lot of things in the Bible is very encouraging. I find it so fascinating, you know, but those are not the things that actually make me believe or not believe. You know, I, I, I believe because the scriptures tell me that I must believe. You know, those who approach God, what do they have to do? They must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So it's, it's like saying to God, okay, you first, <laughs> you first. And if you give me enough, then I'm on board. God gives us enough, but we believe in him on his terms, not on our terms. Some people stop believing in God on their terms. You did this, this bad thing happens to me, we're done, I'm cutting you off, God. 
You know, I could take it when this happened and that happened, but when my lovely wife you know, that I love and that I begged you not to take you know, passed away, that's it, we're done. You went too far, God. We don't set the conditions for faith. He sets the conditions for faith. I'm amazed when I looked up in the sky, I imagine I was past 70 when it, this shows my ignorance, of course, but I looked up in the sky and, and you know, they, they show these magnificent pictures you know, of this, the Milky Way and you see the stars and there's so many of them. You know? And then in the back, there's like, looks like a cloud. It looked like a cloud. You know? And I went, yeah, isn't that amazing? God did all of that. You know? And a couple of years ago, someone pointed out to me, you know that, that cloud that looks like clouds in the back? I said, yeah, I said, those are all stars. <laughs> They're not mist. They're not fog up there. Those are all stars. I mean, it's just mind boggling. And then another quote about Job. It is when Job comes face to face with him that he comes to himself. He does not get definite answers from God. In the book, when God speaks, there is no new instruction, only his presence. God is bent simply on being God. Oh, I love that. <laughs> you know when he said, I am that I am, I am. I am the great I am. Isn't it marvelous? God is bent simply on being God. He has nothing to prove to us. And so the focus of the book is the problem of innocent suffering. The book doesn't actually give easy answers to the question, why do innocent people suffer? Or uh, why do unfair and unjust things happen in this world? People always, it seems to me, mistakenly say, well, we need to go look at the book of Job you know, to get the answers to why there's the suffering. Well, Job doesn't, add, the book of Job does not answer that question. I mean, I hate to give away the plot, you know, but he never finds out. <laughs> God never tells him. We know, you know, we're reading, we're seeing behind the scenes, but he never finds out why he went through all of this stuff. It's almost like you're saying, okay, God, tell him, tell him, you know. Well, Job, you know, it's like this. One day the devil came to me and he said, you know, I bet you I could get Job to deny, you know, and I, no. After all of that suffering, you'd think that Job kind of deserved an explanation but he didn't get one. We need to remember that in our own life. It also presents, the book rather, also presents one particular case and its extraordinary circumstances. In other words, Satan personally attacks an individual and God lets it happen. And, and we are witnesses to the developments and eventual outcome, which is God appears to Job and then he is restored. The circumstances of Job's experience are difficult or impossible to apply directly to ourselves in order to then draw lessons from. You know, it's very, believe it or not, hard to draw lessons from Job. However, how Job feels about his experiences, you know, shock at losing uh, material possessions, sorrow and grief at losing his family, uh, pain and suffering because of his illness, humiliation at the loss of prestige and respect. I was told my children, the most important thing that you have is your name, your name. Once your name is soiled, it's very hard to, to get it back. You can lose a leg, you know what I'm saying? You can lose the vision in your right eye. You can, you can lose a job, you, know, you, you can lose those things, but your name is very important. 
That was one of the things that, that Job suffered, the loss of his prestige, the loss of his honor, the loss of respect. Then of course, frustration and anger at the seeming injustice and unfairness of his situation. He may have also been among those who believe that Personal suffering was the judgment of God upon an individual because of personal sin. Imagine, he's going through all of this and is practically shouting at him, you must have done something wrong. This may have been why he was upset and thought that he was being punished unjustly. He knew that he was a good and just man and yet here he was being punished anyways. The facts didn't line up with his theology. Which one was he going to, he couldn't deny the facts and he was committed to his theology. And that idea is still prevalent today, not as a not as a, uh, an official doctrine or anything, you know, that God punishes you in real time. But that thing, that thing emotionally is still with us today. You, you fall short in doing something. You don't perform the way you think you ought to perform. You simply fail, you know, you just tell a big fat lie or whatever, whatever it is. And along with the guilt, as Christians, right? Along with the guilt, aren't you also wondering if a bad thing is going to happen to you? Or if a bad thing happens, why you happen to have messed up? Don't we all think, hmm, maybe God is punishing me now for what I did? That idea that punishment in real time, that's still alive today. God is not behind it, by the way. That's the other guy that's behind that, that idea. I'm not saying there's no judgment. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that we're not only sometimes very quick to judge ourselves, but we're also very quick to blame ourselves for the bad things that have happened in our lives, which we may really not be responsible for. So we are witnesses to his unjust suffering as well as how he feels and deals with these things as a human being. Our life lessons come from uh, comparing his life experience to ours because to one degree or another, we also experience shock and sorrow and anger and despair. Of course, we rarely experience all of these emotions at the same time over the same issue, but individually or collectively, Job's experience mirrors our experience as people of faith dealing with adversity. So our life doesn't get maybe as bad as his life, but oftentimes we do experience facets of his life. It's as if Job represents a one-stop example of how one believer dealt with suffering he didn't understand and didn't deserve. How many times in your life did you have suffering that you didn't understand and didn't deserve? How many times have you even said that to yourself? I didn't deserve this. I, I tried my best. I, I did what I thought was right. I, 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 I worked hard. I sacrificed for my kids, for example. They didn't turn out exactly the way that I wanted them to. I tried. And so the book of Job doesn't provide nice, neat bullet point solutions to the problems and injustices of life. Instead, Job presents how one man lived a faithful, not a perfect, how, a how he lived a faithful life during a time of crisis in his life. And so many times, you know, I'll close with that, so many times that's the problem, isn't it? We confuse a faithful life with a perfect life. God is not searching for us to have a perfect life. 
That's us wanting that. But he does require a faithful life. And I think of all the things that we can learn from Job is to observe a man living an imperfect but faithful life during a time of adversity. So our own life lessons, therefore, will come from examining Job's journey from a blessed life to unjust suffering and loss to revelation and then finally restoration for a blessed life once again. So we're gonna follow that journey and we're gonna follow it in the various crises that he has and we're gonna examine each crisis that he has in his life. Physical crisis, theological crisis, spiritual crisis and how all of this is resolved in the end. So next lesson we're gonna look at the, out, the possible ways you could chop this book up. And we're gonna kind of go over all the characters. So we're kind of familiar with all the characters that appear uh, so that we don't have to spend time explaining them every time you know, we mention their name. I would encourage you uh, to, um, to read uh, Job uh, chapters one, two, and three. If uh, you're not uh, having a daily Bible reading, well then let that be your Bible reading. Take Job, read one to three. Uh, because this is not going to be a line by line study, but a thematic study. So I'm going to quote some of it. We're going to look carefully at some passages, but it's a way too long a book to do in nine, 10 weeks. Uh, so I'm expecting those of you in the class and you folks at home watching, read ahead, be familiar with what I'm going to be talking about next week. All right, that's our class for this time. Thank you for your attention.